I'm Bruce Gordon, author of the book, the Facebook page, and the YouTube channel, all titled The Spirit of Attack. I've published over 20 videos. Viewers liked them, and they wanted more. They say they especially liked the personal parts that are not found in the specifications or the official reports. I'm going to tell you about alert hangers, where we sat alert waiting to be scrambled. I flew the F-100, F-102, and F-106 and was scrambled from their alert hangers. So this is about alert hangers for fighters in the 1960s. My first operational fighter was the F-102. It had good radar, infrared search and track, and both radar and infrared missiles. I was assigned to the 317th Fighter Interceptor Squadron in Elmendorf Air Force Base, Alaska. Their motto was the spirit of attack. And from that, I got the name of my book, my Facebook page, and my YouTube channel. Elmendorf is close to the big city of Anchorage. We did our heavy maintenance there and most of our training. We had advanced bases at Eielson, Galena, and King Salmon. From these bases, we could intercept planes all the way from the Arctic Ocean in the north, the Bering Strait to the west, the Aleutian Chain on the southwest, and the Gulf of Alaska to the south. From Elmendorf, we would deploy to one of the forward bases for a week at a time before returning to Elmendorf for a day off and then more training. We usually flew fully armed with radar and infrared missiles. I'll tell about these four alert hangers first and then talk about the alert hangers in South Korea and Vietnam later. This screen grab from Google Maps shows that the alert hangar at Elmendorf Air Force Base hasn't changed much since the 1960s. There are eight aircraft hangars with a darker area in the middle, which is the crew quarters where the air crew and maintenance crew stay. The hangar is angled toward the runway for fast taxi and takeoff. We were usually on five minute alert to take off within five minutes of scramble, but under ideal conditions, we could get off the ground in only two minutes. For security reasons, we didn't take pictures of our alert hangar from the ground. I looked on the internet, but couldn't find anything suitable. So I'll describe it from here. The aircraft hangars had fast acting doors front and rear. In case there was electrical failure, there was a system of weights that would spring the doors open rapidly. The aircraft could usually be taxied in around to the back and to the face out forward for takeoff. However, some of them, you push the airplane backwards into the hangar. The alert facility was three stories high. The ground floor was for maintenance with some lounge area. The second floor was for the pilots with a lounge area, sleeping quarters, a small kitchen, and a bathroom. The third floor was the main dining hall, and across from that there was the maintenance crew's rest area. A stairs ran between all the floors 
and along one wall there was a fire pole like firemen used to get down to their fire trucks. The fire pole had doors between the floors to keep heat and noise from going between floors. The weight of a person on the pole opened the doors. It made quite a noise, but that didn't matter because the scramble order had just been given and everyone was running for the pole anyway. The fire pole went through a hole in the floor that was big enough so you had to jump out, grab it with your hands, wrap your arms and legs around it and slide down to the mat on the bottom floor. The scramble order was given by a klaxon horn. Followed by a loudspeaker, scramble, two F-102s, scramble, two F-102s. In addition to the usual five-minute scramble, we had battle stations. On battle stations, the pilots were in the cockpits, the doors were open, but the engines were not running, so we weren't using fuel. We could get airborne from battle stations within two minutes. Once a pilot missed his grip on the pole and went down to the bottom floor much too fast, ended up on the mat, and that's when his problems began because the other people coming down the pole landed on top of him. He wasn't badly hurt, but it shows that you've got to get your grip on that pole. We also had an alert hangar up at Eielson Air Force Base near Fairbanks, Alaska. This Google Maps photo shows that the alert hangar has been completely replaced from the one I served in in the 1960s. However, it's on the same clear shot to the runway that is typical of an alert hangar. During the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, I was pulling alert for the first time in the new alert hangar. We were armed with nuclear weapons, the AIM-26 nuclear falcon. I was upstairs on the third floor having lunch. There was a contractor in the hall doing some work on wires in the new building, but I didn't pay much attention to him. Suddenly, the klaxon blared. As I jumped from the table and ran for the fire pole, the contractor was yelling something, but I didn't pay any attention. I got all the way down and got into the cockpit before the word got to me that this was just a test. I talked to the contractor afterwards, and he said he was just testing it, and then he thought maybe he might have started World War III. I did get an active air scramble during the Cuban crisis. I flew my F-102 north to the edge of Alaska and intercepted a B-52, which was returning from his nuclear patrol near Russia. He was 30 minutes off on his return time, so we intercepted him. This map is just to remind you where these four bases are as we talk about next Galena and then King Salmon. Galena Air Force Station in the west was much smaller than Elmendorf or Eielson. It was beside the Yukon River, so it had a 50-foot dike running all around the base to keep out the water. Galena was known for being extremely cold and it was there that I first encountered 50 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. You can see in the circle here the alert hangar which was just about the uh, with a good shot to the runway 
It was very similar to the other alert hangers. From Galena, we could range all the way across the Bering Sea to Russia. And during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, we had our hangars full with double crews pulling double alert. A general came down and asked us what we had to show for entertainment, and we showed him a deck of cards. He gave the word, and from then on, we had full-length movies with projectors and showed them at, in our alert hangar. King Salmon in the southwest gave us coverage of the Bering Sea, the Aleutian Islands, and in the east, the Gulf of Alaska. But I don't remember it for those things. I remember it for the fishing. It's named King Salmon after the very large salmon fish that can be caught there. That is a beautiful place for fishing, and VIPs came from all over to fish at King Salmon. We usually had two F-102s on 5-minute alert and two on 30-minute alert. So the ones on 30-minute alert could go down to the nearby Naknek River and fish for King Salmon right off the dock and catch some amazing fish. During my three years in Alaska, I had about 15 active air defense scrambles against either Russians or unknowns penetrating our air defense identification zone. Then I was transferred down to F-106s at Selfridge Air Force Base, Michigan. I pulled alert in their hangars, but never had any active air scrambles. The F-106s, though, were getting training in air-to-air -air combat against fighters. When the Pueblo and RC-121 shootdown crises occurred with North Korea, the F-106s were deployed across the Pacific with aerial refueling to defend South Korea. At Osan Air Base in South Korea, the aircraft were grouped in diamond-shaped clusters. The F-106s with the air defense role were located closest to the end of the runway in A Diamond. The F-4s with a strike mission were in B Diamond and in C Diamond were other aircraft. We we're only about five minutes flying time south of North Korea so there was a real threat of enemy air attack or rockets coming on our positions. Our hangars were therefore reinforced with reinforced steel in concrete. The alert pilots stayed in a small building close to their airplanes. There were enough pilots in the area so we changed crews frequently enough that we did not have to sleep in those quarters. I had a number of active air scrambles while I was in South Korea, mostly against Russians snooping along the east coast of South Korea, and we were always able to make our five-minute scramble time. From F-106s, I transitioned into the F-100 and was promptly sent to Vietnam, where we had the same kind of reinforced concrete shelters for our fighters as we had had in South Korea. There was a real need for those reinforced shelters because the VC in the hills would fire rockets down at our base. However, none of their rockets ever hit our aircraft areas and I believe we were just out of range of their launch sites in the mountains. Some of the shelters had blast curtains, heavy material hanging down from electrically powered rods 
in the front of the hangers, but they were never closed. They were always open, and I was sitting in the cockpit once looking up at those curtains, and they had the most humongous spiders that I have ever seen. That was a hard thing. If you ever opened or closed those, you'd have spiders all over the place. The alert facility at Fan Rang was all on one floor, so it didn't have a fire pole. It had a lounge area and a cafeteria. We didn't sleep there. We just changed crews. And we usually had a flight during the time we were on alert. Our scrambles were for supporting ground troops. The F-100s on alert used pyrotechnic cartridges for starters. They caused a lot of black smoke, but they started the engine reliably and rapidly. The weapons on the F-100 were not armed or had safety pins in them. So we had to taxi to the end of the runway to an army area where they pulled the pins and charged the guns. As a result, we couldn't scramble as fast in the F-100 as we could in the F-102 or F-106. Instead of from a two to five minute scramble on the F-102 and F-106, the F-100 took about 10 to 15 minutes to scramble. Most of my stories are in my book, The Spirit of Attack, which is available from Amazon.com for about $34. On the other hand, you can get it from me directly. Just send $20 che cash, check, or PayPal to Bruce Gordon, 105 Broadbill Court in Georgetown, Kentucky, 40324. And I'll send it to you postage paid, and I'll autograph it for you.